I'm going to have you take your Bibles, if you would, and find your way to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you to grab one of the Bibles in front of you as we follow along to see what God, God's Word has to say. Um, uh, Ethan mentioned about our scatter survey, and, and really, we're really encouraged about what this survey will do, because one of the things we've continued to talk about is, where are you this time tomorrow? And how will you be on mission this time tomorrow? Because as we scatter, we want to be on mission. It's not just about coming to church on Sunday, but it's about who we are the other six days a week. And so this survey that we're doing is going to help us help you be better missionaries wherever you are and wherever you work. So thank you for being a part of that. The title of today's message is The Temptation. The Temptation. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been tempted, because I know the answer to that. And if you say you've never been tempted, then you probably need to work on your sin issues. But I am going to ask you three questions, and I'm going to ask you to answer these, and uh, not out loud, but to yourself. Here's the first question. How many of you have ever experienced a spiritual high? A spiritual high. In fact, I would tell you, this last hour we baptized six people, and it was a spiritual high. When you go through baptisms, when, you, when you, you come to Christ, maybe you've overcome a besetting sin, maybe you've had a time of encouragement, or, or you've had a great health report, you've entered into a new relationship, the spiritual high. But at the same time, how many of you have ever experienced a spiritual low? Maybe you're currently experiencing spiritual low. Didn't get a promotion, gave in to sin, had a fight with someone you love, maybe got a bad health prognosis, maybe feeling far from God. Spiritual high, spiritual low, or maybe, here's this question, have you ever let your guard down? You stop protecting yourself. You stop protecting yourself from what you know you need to protect yourself from. Maybe hanging with people you know you shouldn't hang with, going to places that aren't good for you, or going to a website that you know you shouldn't go to, or maybe following somebody on social media that just causes you to go into a downward spiral. Now, if you've answered yes to any of those or all of those, you are ripe for spiritual attack. Why do I say that? Let me give you two verses. 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, and this is right after Peter says, God resists the proud, he rewards the humble, and he says, he says be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Satan, our adversary, the deceiver, is prowling around like a roaring lion, not a roaring lion, but like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, to destroy. Here's another verse. Right after Jesus is tempted, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but in Luke's, in, in Luke's account, it says this at verse 13, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Satan's patient. Satan plays the long game. He waits until an opportune time. Yet he's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might destroy. And that's why we have to be on guard. In fact, that leads us to the, to the big idea of the message, which is this. Be on guard. Why? Because Satan is looking for opportunities to destroy you. He's looking for opportunities to destroy you. Are you on guard? Have you let your guard down? Or have you put on the full armor of God, doing all you can to stand, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Let's read this passage, and I'm actually going to read in the passage we talked about last week, starting in verse 9, and we'll go down through verse 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, 
With you, I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Mark 1, verses 12 and 13 is the most condensed account of the temptation of Jesus. In fact, Matthew uses 11 verses. Luke uses 13 verses. Mark, only two. So if you look at verse 12, it says, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Who drove Jesus out into the wilderness? The Spirit of God. I think it's important for us to understand that. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says, then Jesus was led up by the this, by this Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This wasn't some chance encounter. This was a divine appointment. It was scheduled by the Father and executed by the Spirit. But the question is why? Why would he be led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Well, let me give you some answers and then we'll look into the text. I'll put all four up. First of all, to test his obedience. Would he trust in God? He was beginning his public ministry, which would culminate at the cross. Would he be obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross? It would start here. Would he be obedient? He was testing his obedience. Secondly, it would be to demonstrate his sinfulness. Why was it so important that Jesus would be sin, that he would be sinless? Because he was God's spotless lamb who would be slain for the sins of the world. He would would be, in fact, he would be the fulfillment of 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might receive the righteousness of God. See, Jesus' perfect righteousness would be imputed to our account as our sin would be laid upon Jesus upon the cross. And so it was important for him to demonstrate his sinlessness. Third, to demonstrate his authority over Satan. It would foreshadow his ultimate victory over sin and over death through his death and resurrection, where sin would be defeated, where Satan would be defeated. And finally, by being tempted, he would identify with, his, with our humanity. Jesus, fully God, was also fully man. And he would identify with us, and we would be able to, to go to the throne of grace because Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And that's when he says, so you can boldly come before the throne of grace. So let's look at some lessons on temptation. Now, I'm not going to teach you how to be tempted. We, we, we learn some lessons from the scripture about temptation. First, Satan uses opportune times to tempt you. We we saw that in Luke chapter 4, verse 13. But Satan uses opportune times to tempt you. Now, there's a point that I want to make, and I think this is really important for us to understand, and not just understand, but take in. And that's this. God's leading doesn't always lead to easy circumstances. Just because God is leading you, it doesn't mean that your circumstances are going to be easy. In fact, it could be quite the opposite. We see that here with Jesus. See, we sometimes think if we do everything right, then life will be easy. God's leading us. We're doing what he says we should do. Uh, We should have no obstacles. But see, that's the prosperity gospel. That's not what the Bible teaches In fact, the Bible teaches us that Jesus had no place to lay his head. The Bible teaches us that Paul, the great apostle Paul, who spent three years out in the wilderness with Jesus, he went through incredible trials, incredible difficulties. 2 Corinthians 11 tells us five times he was beaten, he was was whipped, 40 lashes minus one. Three times he was beaten. He was shipwrecked, he was stoned, he was left for dead. We know that the disciples, the various disciples, were martyred. Stephen was martyred. 
It teaches us that times, there are times where God is working behind the scenes to accomplish something so much greater than we can even see. We don't even know what he's doing. You just study the life of Joseph and you will see that. When God is leading you, don't be surprised if you're tempted by Satan and exposed to the wilderness of the world. So the point is Satan uses opportune times to tempt you. So what are some of those opportune times? Well, we just discussed it. Let me review them. First of all, after spiritual highs. After spiritual highs. Now, Jesus had just had this incredible mountaintop experience. Look again at verse 9. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Remember, there were thousands of people out there, and he would have come, and, and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it says he was baptized, and it, and it says in verse 10, And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. That word schism, we talked about it last week, it, it, was, it was torn open. The only other time that word was used was in the temple, when the temple curtain tore from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross. We see this, this, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove on Jesus, empowering him for his ministry. And then we, we hear a, a, a word from heaven where God says, this is my son, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. I mean, talk about a spiritually high moment. I mean, it should have been a time of great celebration. Bring out the, the, the best tuna casseroles, the jello molds, unite. We're going to have a celebration. This is going to be fun. The church is going to come together. But what happened? Verse 12, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And it was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. That word drove in verse 12, it means to drive with force. It means to impel. Jesus didn't just decide to go. The Spirit drove him. It's the same word that's used for Jesus driving out demons. This was a time of testing and preparation on the heels of a spiritual mountaintop. We have to be prepared because when we have spiritual mountaintops, when we have certain highs, we have to be careful because Satan will use, he might use those times to tempt us. But not only during after spiritual highs, but during spiritual weakness, during times of weakness. Notice what it says. He was 40 days in the wilderness. Now, for those of you from the Pacific Northwest, when you think of wilderness, what do you think? You're thinking of pine trees, you're thinking of mountains, you're thinking of streams. Think again. That's not what's going on here. This is, this is like halfway between here and Tucson. This is, this is out in the wilderness. It's like, it's sand, it's dirt, it's rocks, it's harsh. That's the type of wilderness he was taken out into. There were wild animals. In fact, both Matthew and Luke tell us that he fasted for 40 days. Jesus is fully man and fully God. He would have been hungry. He would have been alone, tired, in a very weakened state. The 40 days reminds us of Moses' time up on Mount Sinai and uh, Elijah's 40 days up on Mount Horeb. Both were, were deliverers where Jesus is the ultimate deliverer. But notice what it says. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. It's in the, the tempt is in the participle, meaning it was ongoing. It didn't just, wasn't just one temptation, one and done. It was a continual temptation for 40 days. That word tempt, it means to try or to prove, to test. Jesus was being tested. His faith was being proved out, his obedience. In Jesus' weakened state, Satan was trying to get Jesus to sin. He was trying to get him to disobey the Father's will. In our Wednesday preaching team uh, meeting, one of the guys mentioned the word halt for using weakened states when we're susceptible. Halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, halt. 
There's times when we're, we're hungry, we're weak, and give in to sin. When we're angry, we've been in a fight. Maybe we're lonely, give in to sin, or we're tired. You can add to that emotional stress or big decisions. Maybe you've had a fight with someone you love. You have health issues or maybe uncertainly about the future. These are times where Satan loves to put us to the test, to tempt us to expose our weaknesses. And the temptations fly at you. Maybe you have, if you have an eating issue, you just you start eating. If a drinking issue, you drink. Or you medicate. Or maybe you go shopping when you know you shouldn't. Or maybe pornography or, or flirting or self-sufficiency. See, Jesus is on a mission for God, and Satan's goal was to thwart that mission, but we're on a mission for God also, right? We've been, we've been commissioned by God, Matthew 28, to go and make disciples. We're called to be his witnesses, and it is in those times that, that Satan wants to thwart our mission. So temptations can come after spiritual highs, they can come during spiritual lows, or when you let your guard down, when your guard is down. Now, let me ask a question. Is being, tempted to, is being tempted a sin? No. It's what you do with that temptation. How do you respond to the, tempta- to the temptation? There are times, though, where we think we're good. I've had a pretty good run. Spiritually feel like I'm good. Feeling good, doing good. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 reminds us that we have to be careful. It says, you who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. He's just talked about Israel was an example for us, how they were out in the wilderness in a weakened state, thinking they were good, how they entered into sexual immorality, they desired evil. They, they, they grumbled, they went into idolatry, and ultimately they were destroyed by the destroyer. The fact is, we can become complacent. That's why right on the heels of that, Paul says, you who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. The fact is, we can become complacent. I've had that happen to me. I remember we'd not been believers for more than a year, and this was in 19, probably 98, and I was at a men's Bible study, and a guy named Neil Jeffrey was preaching on adultery and the importance of protecting yourself. And I'm looking around this room of men, I'm thinking, what a bunch of chumps. Like, why do they even have to be reminded of that? Like, I'm good, I love my wife. That would never happen to me. And then, I mean, it happened in a moment. Neil said, and if you're sitting there thinking it'll never happen to you, you're closer than anybody else. Like, I don't know if anybody could hear my gulp, but it was loud. Because that, like, all of a sudden I realized, man, like, here you are in your pride thinking it can't happen to you. And and that's why it's so important that we're always on guard. Because Satan, 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 (laughs) Satan, he's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might destroy. And I probably was closer than anybody else. And that's why I like to say, and as my pastor used to say, I run a little bit scared because like, I want to keep my guard up because I don't want it to ever happen to me because like, I, I, I run through the traps. I think about having to go and tell my wife. And if I survive that, telling my kids <laughs> and then telling the church. And, and, and the Lord already knows. Satan uses opportune times to tempt you. After spiritual highs, during spiritual weaknesses, when you let your guard down. But he also uses three types of temptations to try to tempt, to try to destroy you. He uses three types of temptations. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and you're in Mark, just turn back a few pages to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Now, if you look on the screen, my point is, Satan uses three types of temptation to try to destroy you. Isn't that word destroy a little bit harsh? I mean, isn't that like, isn't that kind of hyperbolic? 
No. We talked about 1 Peter 5, 8, that Satan is like a roaring lion prowling around seeking whom he might devour. Think of a roaring lion devouring his prey, destroying his prey. Listen to what Jesus says in John 10, 10. The thief, being Satan, the tempter, the destroyer, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. See the word destroy? Satan's goal is to destroy us, to destroy our testimony, to destroy our witness. He says, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I mean, there's a huge contrast there. That's why we have to be so careful. It's prowling around, but Satan uses three types of temptation. John, in 1 John chapter 2, he describes those three types of temptations. He's, he's first talked about that let's not, you know, do not be in love with the things of the world. And then he says, for all that is in the world, and here's the three temptations, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Three types of temptations. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, and the pride of life. And let me just say this. Those aren't new. In fact, those are the oldest tricks in the book. In fact, think about creation. Genesis 1 and 2. It's the creation account. God created the heavens and the earth. He created all that is in it. He saw that it was good. He created us. In Genesis chapter 2. He gave Adam a clear command. You can eat of all the trees in the garden, but of the tree of, the, uh, of, of, of knowledge and wisdom, you can't eat of that tree. Very clear. Genesis chapter 3, enter Satan. He goes to Eve. Did God really say you can't eat of that tree? Questioning God's word. And then he says, God didn't say. Refuting God's word. And, and, and then we see that Eve thinks, oh, hmm, not a bad plan. And, and so we see in, in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 5, it says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So this is Satan's words. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and that it was delightful to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, pride of life. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Like a massive leadership failure right there. We see those same types of temptation here in Matthew chapter 4. Luke recounts it also. What's the first one? The first one is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Now we said that Jesus was in a weakened state. Notice verse one of chapter four. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That's quite the understatement to me. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus was in a weakened state. Satan comes to him. He wants to disrupt God's care for him. And, and he wants Jesus to take matters into his own hands. Yet Satan was saying, if God really cared for you, would he allow you to be hungry? Would he deny you this food? Would he allow you to be in the wilderness all alone? Sometimes we can ask ourselves those questions. And then he says this, verse 3, if you are the son of God. This was not a question. See, Satan would have seen the coronation. He would have seen, he would have heard the words of God, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He's effectively saying, since you are the son of God, command these Stones to become loaves of bread. Satan appealed to the physical, to the lust of the flesh. He creates doubt. Are you just going to allow yourself to starve? Why deny yourself? 
go ahead, Jesus, prove you're the son of God. How often have we done that? Like, why am I being denied this pleasure? Let me just say one thing about Jesus being tempted. He never gave in, which makes the temptation even worse. Because a lot of times we relieve the temptation by giving into it. Jesus never did. So for him, the temptation would have been even worse. But how did Jesus respond? Verse 4. But he answered, it is written. If you don't have that underlined, it is written in your Bible, you should. If you have one of the church Bibles, underline it. It is written. And he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus quotes specific scripture. It's not just about the physical, but about the spiritual. See, the will of God meant more to Jesus than just food or life. In fact, in the, in the, in the, in the garden, when Jesus was praying, he said, like, Lord, if there's any way, take this cup from me. But then he says, not my will be done, but your will be done. See, the, God's will was more important to Jesus than his physical well-being. God's will should be more important to us than sexual desires, than financial shortcuts, than positional powers. Jesus humbled himself. He went under these trials of extreme hunger to learn obedience through suffering. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 reminds us of that. first type of temptation. It was lust of the flesh. If you're keeping score, it's Jesus one, Satan zero. Which leads to the second temptation. Pride of life. Pride of life. Satan now tempts Jesus to put God to the test. Look at verse five. Then the devil took him to the holy city, that would be Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Josephus, the great Jewish historian, says that would have been about 450 feet in the air. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now Satan quotes scripture. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. So Satan's thinking, Jesus can quote scripture. I'm going to quote scripture. In fact, I would say that Satan knows scripture better than anybody in this room. He knows how to use scripture, but he also knows how to twist scripture. He takes it out of context here. In fact, not only does he take it out of context, but he left out a portion of the verse. He's proof texting. He's using this text to try to make a point. I remember when Pam and I became Christians and there was this very popular book that was going around by a very famous Christian author. And it was, there was a lot good in there. But he used so many different verses in so many different translations, and he would make a point, and then he would try to find a verse in a translation that would confirm that point. It was proof texting. Versus, this is what the Word of God says, and so that's what we're going to explain. And, and and, and I didn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater because the, the, there were good stuff in the book, but it was, it, was, it was proof texting. And that's what Satan's doing here. He's, he's using scripture. He's twisting it to try to get Jesus to test God. Yet how often do we allow the pride of life to cause us to do something that we shouldn't. It's like, come on, Jesus. You got this. You can, you, can, you can jump off this building, and if God really loves you, I mean, he'll swoop in with his angels, and he'll protect you. He was putting God to the test. How did Jesus respond? Verse 7. He said to him again, it is written. 
You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. He quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. He uses specific scripture. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is a reminder that we aren't to put God to the test by putting ourselves in foolish danger, expecting God to protect us. I'll never forget, we, again, it was early in our ministry, there was a family that we knew where the husband was found to be having adultery and he continued in it and we warned him and he says, listen, God will forgive me. God is a forgiving God. And he was continuing in this ongoing unrepentance. He was testing God. Don't let the pride of life cause you to put God to the test. Brings us to the third temptation. What's the score? Jesus two, Satan zero. Leads us to the lust of the eyes. And Satan is relentless. Look at verse eight. And he said to him, Excuse me, uh, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all, I, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Ultimately, Satan's goal is to be in a place of worship. The one to be worshipped. In fact, if you know your Bible, Isaiah 14 talks about that ultimately is what caused Satan to be cast out of heaven. Along with a third of the angels, the fallen angels. It was pride. And what he does is he goes to Jesus. He takes him up on a high mountain. We don't know what that mountain is. It could have been you know, Mount Carmel. But he says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. We don't know how that happened. Maybe he just gave him a vision of all the kingdoms of the world. He says, all this you can have. It's yours. You just have to bow down to me. What he was saying is, like, no suffering, no cross, no grave. If you just worship me, I'll give you all of this. He, he, he gave him a vision. He, he let him see it, pride of life, or excuse me, lust of the eyes. He was offering Jesus a shortcut to become king. Some might be saying, well, how could Jesus, I mean, how could Satan do that? Did, I mean, did he have the authority to do that? Well, he is the prince of the power of the air. In fact, Jesus tells us that he's the ruler of the world, and it's only for a season. He tells us that in John chapter 12, John chapter 14, John chapter 16. We see it in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and 1 John 5, 19. See, the cross was the father, Father's will. But Satan said, look at it. You can have it all. Just look. Isn't it the look that first causes adultery? Our eyes are the windows into our hearts. And that's why it's so important that even Job 31.1, Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look lustfully upon a woman. We have to be careful at what we look at. I mean, it, it, again, social media, does it cause your heart to long for things that you shouldn't have? How does he respond? Verse 10, then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, he quotes scripture again, Deuteronomy six thirteen. you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He was saying, I'm not going to serve you. I'm only going to serve and, and worship God the Father. And then verse 11 says, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. In a weakened state, you can just imagine what that must have been like with the angels coming to him. Verse 11 reminds us of the importance of resisting the devil. Listen to what James chapter 4, verse 6, verse 7 says. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. And he'll do what? He'll flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But we also know a warning that he will come back at an opportune time. So he uses these three types of temptations, and it's relentless. He'll continue to come at us. It almost feels hopeless, doesn't it? 
but it's not. There is hope. And that brings us to the last lesson. That is, victory over temptation requires using God's available resources. Victory over temptation requires that we use God's available resource, and God has a lot of resources for us. Let me just put those up. The first, I'll give you eight. The first one, the most important one, the Word of God. Jesus continues to say, it is written. It's the Word of God. It's spending time knowing God's Word, so we know how to use God's Word. Psalm 119, 11, your Word I have burned in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 111, your word is a light unto my feet, uh, is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. So important that we know the word of God, so we know the will of God, and we can thwart Satan. And knowing the will of God, we know that we have the resource of the Spirit of God. That the minute we receive Jesus Christ, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're sealed until the day of redemption. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's why we need to, we need to stir up the Spirit at all times. So often we just, we, we quench the Spirit, but we're called to stir it up. And a good reminder for us is 1 John 4.4. 4. He who is in you, the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in the world. Satan, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And because we know the word of God, we have the spirit of God, we know the importance of the family of God. We are saved into a church, into a body of people that love us and care about us. And that's why we put such a high priority on small groups and accountability. You want people that know you, that you could be honest with, they're going to hold your arms up, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to challenge you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Like, I don't want somebody just saying, man, you're fine in your sin. Keep going. You're good. No, none of us want that. Knowing the word of God, we know the importance of worship of God. We're called to worship him. In fact, Matthew 5, 24 tells us you can't serve two masters. We should worship the one true God. In fact, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That leads us to the next five. Knowing the word of God, we know the importance of prayer with God. We have the opportunity to pray with God and pray to God. God allows us to communicate with him. Psalm 34, 17 says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Uh, Jesus in the the garden said in uh, Matthew 26, 41, he says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Let me ask you, how's your prayer life? Is it keeping you from entering into temptation? Well, my prayer life's just not really what it should be. Be careful. Satan's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might destroy. The sixth one is put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us we are to do all that we can to stand. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We should do all that we can to stand. We have have the armor of God. God has provided us with resources to help us to have victory in temptation. I'll call him back. And that leads us to the throne of God. When the temple curtain tore from top to bottom, we saw that last week. We now can enter into the holy of holies, into the holy place. And, and, and the fact is, we're, we're called to come boldly into the throne of grace, where we can find help in time of need. It's not on our own. And the word of God reminds us of the importance, finally, of the gospel of God. To recall his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. Let me put up 1 Peter chapter 1. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again. We need to be... If we don't understand the gospel, if we don't understand what the gospel has done for us, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. We should continually be reminded of the resurrection of Jesus because without the resurrection of Jesus, we are still dead in our sins. We have no hope to an inheritance that is imperishable. It's a reminder of what we have in eternity, an imperishable Inheritance, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. If you don't understand the gospel, if you don't rest in the gospel, you're going to struggle with, with temptation. But it's being reminded of who you are and what God's done for you. How can I give into that temptation knowing what you've done for me, God? It's not bootstrapping it. It's it's resting in Jesus. As our worship team comes up, Paul says this at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. However, you've been tempted, others have been tempted in the same way. God is faithful. He is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Potentially, you're here today listening to this message because this becomes your way of escape. Maybe this becomes your warning. I need to flee this. Or I need to have other people come around me and strengthen me. I need to be open. I need to be honest. My flesh is weak, but I know God won't fail me. And the fact is, we have a, we have a Savior who's indwelt you with the Holy Spirit if you're in Christ. He's given you a church family. Take advantage of that so you can fight the wiles of the devil. Let's pray, and then we're going to respond in worship. And then we'll baptize. Father, we thank you for your word, the truth of your word, the glory of your word, the efficacy of your word. Father, we thank you for the fact that we don't have to live this life alone, being open to temptation. Father, help us to have the faith to trust in you, to trust in your word, to know that you are good and your desire for us is good. Father, if there's anyone here today that's not received you as Lord and Savior, I pray today they would surrender their life to you and call upon Jesus as Lord. And maybe there's somebody here that right now just realizes they've been They've been resisting you and disobedient to you and not being baptized, and maybe they want to be baptized now. So, Lord, move among us right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.